Thank you, uh, and uh, yeah, it's, a, it's my pleasure to uh, present to you the co-founder of this of this session, uh, uh, Dice. You can see it over there. Dice is a differentiate uh, differentiation clustering excellence. It sounds a little uh, a little dull, but it is an amazing research network, uh, basically established to mainstream uh, research on differentiation uh, to not only the research community but also to policymakers uh, and, and the public. And DICE is basically funded from uh, Horizon 2020 and is primarily or primarily consists of three uh, Horizon 2020 projects uh, uh, that focused on differentiation and that were funded between 2019 and 2022. Some of them are actually uh, ending by the end of 2022, so still uh, still running. And, and Tina here and myself, we were happy to be part of one of these projects called EU ITEA, uh, which is uh, the Integration and Differentiation for Accountability. And the other two projects are, I'll have to look down because you know Horizon, they always have these lovely abbreviations that nobody can really remember. Uh, so one, uh, the, the other one was based in University of Oslo, an amazing project really, uh, EU 3D, EU differentiation, dominance and democracy. And the last one is Indivo, uh, integra uh, integrating diversity in the European, uh, in the European Union. What is perhaps most important is that uh, DICE has been uh, co-financing uh, this panel, this uh, discussion on flexibility and differentiation in the EU. And if you're interested in any research on differentiation, flexibility, and these issues, just visit DICE website. Uh, it's down there, it's very easy to find. Well, if you just Google DICE, it's going to be the first hit. And then there is a section on publications that not only includes the three projects that I have just mentioned, but it also provides links, it's a research network, so it also provides links to many other research on differentiation in the, uh, in the EU. So uh, thank you for uh, your you know, patience with this brief uh, introduction on, on uh, differentiation and the DICE project. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. And now to our main topic. The so-called multi-speed Europe, the idea that different parts of the European Union should integrate at different levels and different speed, is in a certain way already the reality. 
we have Eurozone, we have the Schengen area, and other types of grouping of member states. But today's discussion is about further possible progress of multi-speed Europe to other areas. So, for the beginning, I have the same question for all of you. Should the European Union support and further develop the principle of multi-speed Europe? And um, for you, ladies and gentlemen, the same question is on our application slider, so don't hesitate to answer. Uh, our dear guests, uh, please start with a, just a brief and simple answer. If possible, don't worry, we have enough time, so we will elaborate on it deeper in the next minute. So, who wants to start? Maybe Mr. Goldman? Thanks. Dice, dice, dice. Yeah, we got it. <laughs> um, the answer to your question is, well, um, the European, there's another way for the European Union then, to be flexible, um, because if the European Union resists change, um, it, it risks ossification, uh, essentially. And introducing a level of flexibility, of course, is all kinds of uh, benefits, which is you know, to respect the sovereign uh, choices of member states, for those who wanted to go ahead, uh, whilst not being held hostage by those who don't want to go ahead just yet. Um, at the same time, of course, um, allowing for a more effectiveness in policy implementation there where expertise uh, lies. So, in short, I think um, the evolution of flexibility and differentiated integration in the European Union shows that the EU is malleable enough you know, to withstand um, a, a certain level of differentiation without fragmenting into a complete disorder. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good to continue from here. So uh, I'm a foreign and security policy researcher and also studying the EU's neighborhood policies. And for me, it's very difficult to imagine the European Union as a credible, effective, accountable actor, uh, also accountable towards its partners without a differentiation and flexibility. And now I'm talking all, of course, about enlargement, uh, more flexible enlargement, but also uh, effective reactions to different, different foreign policy situations. Uh, for example, as elite groups that uh, enable effective reactions. Or then, to give you a very topical example, we have this European peace facility that was now used for the first time to actually provide lethal aid, lethal material uh, to Ukraine uh, in its uh, defense war towards uh, uh, Russia. And this was enabled by uh, the constructive absence, a mechanism uh, built in that uh, extra budgetary instrument, uh, whereby some member states that were not ready to implement uh, EU level uh, coordination and funding of military aid to Ukraine could say that, okay, we don't, don't block this decision after all, we let you go and move forward without us, and, and then this decision could be made, and we have then provided 3 billion euros of uh, aid to Ukraine through this mechanism. Thank you. Ms. Ratsova? Yes, thank you. Oh, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, yes, uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I completely agree uh, with everything that was said already. Uh, it's already an ongoing issue, uh, so it will be or it's it will be also difficult to kind of you know stop this already ongoing process. And the question is, do we even want to? Because so for example, if you uh, look into uh, what the variable geometry explains, that there may always be irreconcilable differences between member states, and if we don't try to resolve them, then we will be in a stalemate. And especially looking at the size of the EU, you know, uh, 27 member states, there will be always differences. Uh, so maintaining flexibility will be key. Uh, however, in my opinion, it will be important to uh, leave an open door policy as well for those who, for example, are not uh, deciding to further cooperate or deeper cooperate on concrete issues, but might change their mind later or, you know, situations change, global situations, also situations in the country. So it's important to maintain this open door so that we don't end up with closed door clubs. Thank you. Mr. Havarda, should European Union further develop the multi-speed Europe or should we rather avoid it? Thank you uh, for the question. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation. I'm really glad to be here tonight. 
not to lie that this is a great summit, but um, maybe as well because I was co-leading care of him in Think Tank some 10 years ago, so I'm really glad to be here with this summit. And I'm really glad that there is such a good collaboration with the Institute on International Research. Um, I, I will be a little bit more cautious, and, 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 but first I have to say I'm not speaking at my personal capacity, I'm not speaking at the of the Czech government. I will be a little bit more cautious. I think it's really paramount that we maintain unity, especially in the current geopolitical situation. Now, that unity will give us the strength, and, 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 and this is why the Czech presidency on a number of fronts uh, during this uh, several months which we've been is really try to get as much as unity as we can. And, and even if we, we get to the situation that um, maybe some member states not agree, we try anyway to reduce the number of member states. And as you might remember, there's been a long case, there's just one member state, which is not uh, like for uh, long. So, so, so I think from the cause of the war and, and because of the change geopolitics, unity is wrong. So we have to be very careful. Uh, where we actually go for more flexibility or differentiation. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, this is a reality, and, and basically that kind of flexibility allows us to get rid of uh, it's, it's the opt outs, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's different speed, on, uh, on, on especially on the, on the, on the result. Uh, but we have to decide where we want to make that possible and where we need to maintain unity. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this discussion with think tankers here, uh, where they think uh, it's better <coughs> to be more actual, as was mentioned here, uh, especially in, in, in the global setting and in, in, in the foreign policy, uh, at the cost of not being united. So, so there is some opposition to um, I, I will add one more thing to it. Um, really, we fighting multiple wars. And, this is maybe not very really well understood. We really are under hybrid, hybrid attacks, and there is a disinformation war. And, and, and the, the less uh, uh, differences are among, among the states as such, there is less fuel uh, for these types of wars. So, so I, I will be very careful. And as I said, on the other hand, this is reality, and plus, uh, with the enlargement, I think we will need to be looking for new arrangements. Thank you. Ustakova, what's your standpoint? I'll try to be brief because uh, the smartest speakers before me uh, most of the uh, important arguments. Uh, if I read a question over there, uh, should, should flexibility become the norm? Uh, a little bit rephrase your question. I wouldn't say it should become the norm, uh, but at the same time I would, say, I would say it should become embedded in the process of European integration. So I wouldn't say that you know, flexibility or differentiation should become the first go-to mechanism when it comes to, uh, you know, promoting integration in any field or pursuing policies in any field. On the other hand, uh, when common strategies or common, you know, principles, common action cannot easily or cannot be at all adopted uh, via uniform approach, there should then be a mechanism uh, to go ahead uh, based on some kind of flexibility. So I would perhaps be less uh, less, less cautious than um, the Deputy Minister uh, next to me. Uh, and perhaps uh, to reflect on what has been said, sometimes I see flexibility as a means to forging unity at the end of the day. Uh, look just at you know, qualified majority voting, which basically is kind of a flexibility, not a typical differentiation mechanism, but kind of a flexibility decision-making mechanism. If you look on how decision making works in qualified majority voting areas, it very often leads to culture of consensus and forging consensus and unity more than unanimity. Because in unanimity, you can just say no, and the others, you can block them. If you're hungry now because of sanctions or whatever you like. So sometimes these like flexible forms of decision making or forms of differentiated integration are actually in favor of you know, unity, forging unity at the end of the day, rather than. Uh, necessarily leading to fragmentation and you know making differences between member states uh, between member states larger at the end of the day. Obviously this is a process, it's not a short-term issue uh, but sometimes uh, uh, I guess that these flexible forms are actually good uh, when it comes to uh, 
uh, unity and you know, issues of unity or concepts of unity. Thank you. Thank you for the initial introduction to the topic. So most of you were mentioning that um, the multi-speed Europe is already a reality and it's in a way unavoidable. Some skeptics point out that the multi-speed Europe is actually the beginning of the end of the European Union. They argue that it would lead to fragmentation and division of European Union into rival groups, into coalitions for member states. Mr. Blockmans, uh, don't you think that this is the valid argument, that this, this is the real threat? No. <clears throat> um, a, a semantic issue perhaps, but legally important. When we talk about flexibility in the form of differentiated integration, there are legal rules that basically prescribe forms of enhanced cooperation mostly, or opt out possibilities, um, in the development of new policy areas which largely fall within the national competence of the member states. Right? We're not talking about uh, opt outs in the single market, uh, even if they do exist. Uh, Snooze, for example, for the Swiss, for the Swedes. Um, we should not be talking, I think, in differentiated integration terms in, um, when we discuss qualified majority voting. That is a legally prescribed decision-making procedure in the Council, contrary to uh, unanimity voting um, on, on certain issues. We're talking about compositions of member states that advance certain policy areas in, you know, to further the aims of the European integration process as they are listed in the objectives in the treaty um, within prescribed procedural arrangements. So this is not some you know, wishy-washy uh, leaving behind certain member states, this is a, a thought-through process which, is, which has an open door. And so, yes, I mean there, there are difficulties, of course, coordination becomes more difficult if you have several modular modules of uh, compositions of member states across policy areas. Then it becomes difficult, of course, to coordinate, to oversee uh, everything. It's, it's more costly in that, uh, in that respect. Uh, there's, there's maybe dangers to inconsistencies. It becomes more difficult to find synergies across different policy areas. If you have opt-outs, for example, in the military sphere, um, want to investigate war crimes in, uh, in Ukraine uh, by mobilizing the European Public uh, Prosecutor Office where, again, not all member states are involved, then it becomes a bit difficult to put the jigsaw uh, puzzle together. Having said all that, there is a minimum threshold on the number of member states that participate in differentiated integration. It's always a majority. And in fact, if you look at it, uh, and Jan pointed this out, um, at the levels of differentiated integration, it's in fact, you know, always the same member states, roughly, who choose to stand on the sideline, leaving the others to go ahead. And over time, they may choose to jump on board. The Danes just joined uh, or cancelled their opt-out of 30 years in, in uh, the military sphere. Um, so there is this convergence uh, over time uh, that, that happens around the majority. And so I'm not with those doomsayers who say that all of these risks and the, the proliferation of differentiated integration models, which remain quite limited uh, in policy areas, uh, will lead to the fragmentation and the demise of the European Union. I don't see that. Mr. Atova, do you agree with the argumentation of Mr. Bokmans? And maybe before you take your mic, uh, we can move to another survey question, please. Yes, I absolutely agree, and I cannot say it any better that uh, there are legal issues here, and we are already talking about existing procedures, and uh, uh, it was an important example, I think that was mentioned, the change opt-out, and this is what uh, I was also referring to, uh, based on what's happening in the world, changing geopolitical stances, uh, countries may change their stance, some countries may change their new neutrality, and that will have an impact on uh, European policy making, European integration as well, especially when we, for example, talk about foreign security and defense policy, uh, which, uh, as we know, that's uh, very uh, distinguishedly affected uh, by this issue that we are talking about because of the unanimity voting. Uh, in all these major security-related areas. 
Mr. Kovacs, um, you told me before this discussion that you didn't like the term multi-speed Europe because it implies that some countries are driving in a fast lane while the others are slower and lagging behind. But isn't that the, the essence of multi-speed Europe, that some countries are slower in integration than the others? Well, I shouldn't have said it, perhaps no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, I don't, I don't discursively like the term. Uh, because it's, you know, multi-speed very much can... Uh, if you read it, multi-speed, then, then you're the slower one, the faster one. It, it divides between the bad ones and the good ones, because we can somehow feel that the slower one, well, perhaps if it's not on the highway, is sometimes, you know, the one that is not the superior one, but quite the contrary. Uh, and the faster one, when it comes to integration and other, I don't know, if you're running or doing sports, uh, it's usually the better one. Right? So I don't like it discursively, conceptually, uh, as I uh, mentioned in my previous uh, intervention, uh, uh, I like it. So uh, flexible and differentiated seem to me uh, as better discursive uh, terms uh, to denote the same. Uh, and it has been even a check discurse, you know, with the speed. We don't want to be in a slow lane. It's always been said. We don't mean, but it's not necessarily the way. You see, uh, uh, Stephen mentioned the EPBO, the European Public Prosecutor's Office. We would have won if it wasn't for enhanced cooperation. Would it be better? Would the AU be better off without the EPBO? I don't think so. Is there a huge fragmentation because some countries opted out of that? I don't see one. So, you know, not multi speed Europe for me, but flexibility or differentiation as a more, you know, appropriate terms to denote the same. Mr. Haverda, you are the only representative of government, uh, Czech government, obviously. So, uh, when we are talking about countries who are uh, not so eager to join that uh, fast lane, me to say it. We have maybe a good example of uh, Czech Republic. Czech government is not currently planning to join the Eurozone in the near future. So we might say that some countries are intentionally slowing down their integration into the EU. Is that correct? Do you agree? Uh, I, I think the discussion on, on, on the Euro is not finished inside this government. So I'm sorry, just to say this. And um, I, I maybe wanted to, uh, to, to, to make a couple of comments on what, what has been said. Um, one is, and this is really important as well from the Czech perspective, I agree with, 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 with the co-panelists on, on many things we would just not have because we would never get enough power to win enough power if we wanted everyone to, to, to be there from the outset. Uh, so, so this is really important. Uh, at the same time, we really have to be very careful what these are as are. And I would really pledge to differentiate. Uh, and this is a little bit as well the, the answer to, to your question about the Czech Republic. I think we, we could be looking into different areas, and in some of the areas we want to be leaders. Somewhere we just you know, be the situation that we are like, we, we not ready uh, to, 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 to lead it. And that, this is quite natural because there is a different, different different um, different pace of development. Having said that, first we need to be careful, as I said, the geopolitics are not keep repeating this dual plan. We really have to be careful not to jeopardize the, the, the external unit, which is crucial uh, for us. Second is at the same time um, we need to make sure that this kind of a multi-speed does not go completely against what we call cohesion policy. So we need to make sure that what is happening is actually not contributing to, uh, to inequalities uh, in, in, inside. Mm -hmm. Third, um, and this is what I would react to the problem on the other from different uh, previous rounds is you really need to be very careful what are the internal costs of the potential differentiation or what is the whatever, whatever term we could use. Because we are in the situation that uh, economic crisis is swimming. Uh, we have the energy crisis. Uh, um, we're going to see how how winter, how harsh the winter is going to be. And, and 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 this is all the fuel. Uh, we have the highest inflation in, in, in the case. Uh, we see really big problems across the Atlantic in terms of the economy. And uh, and 
and this is all of you for the proposed elements. And, 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 and we just need to be careful not to bring uh, this up. And, and at the same time, when we already have proposed elements in a certain member states, not to actually support and, and, and continue in there uh, you know, to, to, to promote them and to give them again, again, again more, uh, more arguments and, and more kind of a view for the information. So, so, so I think, you know, all of these aspects actually need to be taken into account and, and uh, I'm quite, you know, having said several times in the general first council, uh, I think this is the situation. I mean, the member states, of course, very much uh, reflect this. At the same time, some of the member states are kind of ready to, to, to go ahead in, in different areas. And I think we might, we might want to touch on the conference of the future of Europe. In connection with a flexible Europe, we hear often the terms uh, lead groups or flexible groups. Uh, we have groups of member states uh, which are acting in a specific fields uh, on behalf of the EU, especially in a field uh, of foreign policy or defense or security. Ms. Kajolainen, you are dealing with the topic of flexible groups in your research. How efficient it has been in defense policy and uh, would you characterize the flexible groups as a way forward? For your opinion. Thank you. Maybe to start with, uh, we need to differentiate between the treaty based differentiated integration. Uh, of such, we have the example of permanent structured cooperation, for example, in a sector defense field or, or enhanced cooperation in the field of foreign and security policies, not huge, however. Uh, but then, uh, what we see more in, in the fields of foreign security and defense policies are these kind of informal, flexible, ad hoc uh, groupings uh, being formed to ad, ad, uh, address different uh, situations. And in the field of defense, we are we have been studying uh, these groups such as uh, JEF, so the Joint Expeditionary Force, EI2, the French-led European Intervention Initiative, and also the German uh, FNC. Two of these originate from the uh, NATO framework, but have then detached from that and kind of operate in the margins of both EU and NATO. And we have found these formats to kind of pave the way towards more integration in the in European defense, uh, building joint strategic culture, uh, having building capabilities together, or even exercising together. When it comes then to foreign policy and, and the lead groups, we have. Um, we investigated some examples and we came to, came to a conclusion that actually, uh, I think it was already argued by uh, Mr. Blockmans before that when these groupings adhere to uh, common values and uh, established stances in the EU, please correct me if I remember wrong, then these groups are more likely to uh, build more effective EU foreign security policies. Then we elaborated this a bit more and argued that these, uh, this differentiation in EU foreign security policy is likely to bring about a relative uh, improvement, but not likely absolute uh, improvement in the sense that we have a better outcome than without differentiation, but not really an ideal solution. More likely, Norman deformment and the Franco German duo in, the, in uh, those negotiations is a good example where the involvement of France and Germany actually meant that we would have a European involvement in conflict resolution. It meant that we finally had the Minsk agreements and, and the escalation in eastern Ukraine. So it was kind of a relative uh, improvement, but it was not, of course, an ideal solution. And now we see what is the outcome for Ukraine. It was not an uh, optimal, optimal deal. Yes, you mentioned Normandy format, uh, the group of uh, France, Germany, Ukraine and Russia. It was established in 2014 uh, with a goal to resolve the conflict in Donbass. Now we have the year 22, 22 and uh, the terrible war in Ukraine. So, Mr. Blockmans, it seems that like that Normandy format did not achieve much, or am I wrong? Well, it failed, obviously, but that's not due to the fact that France and Germany's role in um, the process um, was not able to adhere position of the 27 member states of the European Union. It would have been better had, you know, like in the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action for the Nuclear Deal for Iran. We had three big member states on board that France and Germany in the Normandy format were to be flanked by the High Representative, the EU's High 
High Representative, you know, we could, with the support of the European External Action Service, better coordinate, of course, um, the, the common position. Um, that position could have been prepared by a number of member states, but always be brought back in the common uh, decision-making procedure of, uh, of the Council. But to answer your question, yes, uh, the Normandy format failed, but uh, through forces beyond um, France and Germany. What were they the best countries with the best expertise um, to engage Russia and Ukraine in that type of conversation? If you ask in Warsaw, if you ask in Tallinn, um, the answer would be quite clear. And do you maybe uh, see some uh, present issues which could be solved by using these formats of lead groups? I mean, theoretically, of course, it's quite attractive to think that foreign policy can be pioneered by those member states that have expertise, uh, ex uh, that have people who are trusted in uh, diplomatic processes, the authority uh, as well, to pioneer basically a common foreign and security standpoint for the European Union. And this is a, a, a way of working which I think the member states are increasingly endorsing. Um, and which I think the High Representative and his EES should stimulate, you know. Um, concrete issues, uh, well, I mean, the Finnish, uh, was it Foreign Minister with Africa expertise, basically, quite, you know, counterintuitive, perhaps, um, has been trailblazing uh, some, you know, uh, policies on, uh, of the European Union in Africa. Um, so, where resources lie, they should be mobilized as effectively as possible uh, for the common good, that's the idea. Mr. Kovács, uh, you exam examined the position of small states uh, towards elite groups in a foreign and defense policy. So, what do you find out? Don't they feel excluded? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say small state, states per se, uh, because uh, we're looking really at the Czech Republic. I mean, we're looking at politicians, uh, so politicians' perspectives. Uh, and then you would really have to uh, add, it's a Eurosceptic small member state. And the Eurosceptic is perhaps the more important than the small or mid-sized or whatever you call it, Czech Republic. Uh, so what I will say what we found is, not my opinion, um, speaking in the capacity of our conclusions, uh, what we found, and well, yeah, they do feel excluded that these politicians in a uh, Eurosceptic small member state, they feel excluded by elite groups uh, and they feel dominated sometimes, or they at least use the argument that this is a domination of the large countries. Because if you look at the lead groups in the past, it's always France and Germany there, somehow, quite logical on the other hand, or at least, you know, to the time we did the research, perhaps now you have more spearheading by, uh, by uh, foreign policy issues by some other uh, countries, uh, excluding France and Germany. Uh, so they feel excluded, uh, they feel dominated sometimes, uh, but what the main argument at the end of the day was, well, they do have some power, they do have added value, and the argument against that, or how to improve them was, we should perhaps be less informal in conducting these lead groups, or try to more formally link them uh, to formal uh, foreign policy making, you know, to high representative, a uh, formal transmission of information to the Euro the summit of the European Council. Uh, so the argument eventually was, well, yeah, we can survive lead groups, but let's use a little more connection, or let's use them in a more deeper connection to the formal foreign policy and security policy processes, or even use the formal article that there is in a treaty. You know, countries can be delegated, formally delegated, to conduct foreign policy uh, by, by all countries, obviously. So you can have a selected countries being delegated. So they can live with it, but perhaps more accountability and legitimacy would be ensured by, you know, deeper embedding of these lead groups, informal groupings, differentiated groupings, to formal policy making processes. That's basically what we found. Mr. Haruda, do you agree? And uh, does your government feel excluded? <laughs> uh, yes, as, a, as, a, as a president, maybe not so much. <laughs> 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 no, I, 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 
I, I, I don't feel to be an expert on, on this area, so sorry, so just you know, correct me if I'm wrong. But I, 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 I'm, I'm very sympathizing with what Tina just uh, said. I think it is really important to to make sure those things to happen, and, and as well, it, 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 it's, it's for what's, what Steve was mentioning. One is this this link to 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 the established. Uh, want to say bureaucratic, but to the established processes and structures. That's one. Um, second, which is connected, is, is inclusiveness. I think we need to be careful that we, we get a small group, starts to lead something, and, and, and the others are factual excluded, and, and cannot have their voice to be at least heard, not to be uh, uh, not to be fully taken into account. This is a difference which we have in the council. Everybody speaks. And, 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 and this is very strong because even very small countries, and I've seen it again in, 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 in the past months, get hurt and, and get their vital interests to be taken into account. And there might be vital interests, and I'm not talking, for example, about all the time. There might be very vital interests uh, on the table, which just to duel all of two very large states which are inside the and just cannot see. And, and, and not necessarily actually the institutions, see it, so the experts in the institutions. And, and we had some experiences that, as, as well on the, at the beginning of the process. That the, the proposals come just do not really take into account the vital interest of one or two countries. And, and, and then it takes lots of effort. So, so, so we had a discussion that these proposals need to be you know, much better solved beforehand, actually. Uh, they are, they are put, put forward uh, by the government party, which are the commission. Um, yes, so, 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 so this, is, this, this, this is my take on this. And, um, on the other hand, I think it is worthy to be trying to include more than one member state. And uh, please don't quote me on this, but you know, there was a unilateral decision, basically, if I understood correctly. Uh, to place a large part of the energy consumption of one large member state on a really untrustful partner. And, 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 you know, and we had, we had the, the other member states, especially the Baltics in this case, to be very vocal about this, but again, it was not taken into account. So I think maybe if there are more member states involved, uh, this could be discussed at least in some group. You know, only one, two, three would be different than just one, it's one national government at, at one very Thank you. Let's move to another topic and another survey question. EU is sometimes paralyzed by a unanimous voting system. Recently, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, during his visit to Prague, supported the transition from unanimous to majority voting in several areas. So, should EU accept majority voting in the fields that are currently decided uh, by unanimity? Um, I don't know who wants to start, maybe Mr. Blockmans? As I said before, to me this is not differentiated integration. This is a change of decision-making policy where all member states participate in that policy. And if a qualified majority vote is taken, the vote is binding in budgetary sense, in the legal sense, on all member states, even if they are outvoted. So th this is not the modular composition to advance a certain policy, uh, policy field or to opt out uh, from it. Now, having said that, um, what Schultz uh, mentioned, you know, is uh, vieux jeu, as the French uh, say. The idea about qualified majority voting in, uh, in common and foreign security policy has been around for ages, uh, and it will probably never be implemented, uh, simply because member states will always have a feeling that certain vital interests cannot be protected even if they would have uh, an emergency break procedure uh, to a qualified majority uh, vote uh, that for vital and stated national reasons, uh, sovereign protection basically, uh, would have to be switched to, to unanimity. I, I simply don't see it uh, happen. There will always be an outlier in ongoing negotiations um, to amend the treaties uh, to, to block this. Um, if we move in that direction, then we will have probably changed the composition of the European Union already. And we're not talking about the same thing anymore. Okay. Ms. Carolina? Thank you. 
for me, the question, again, in the field of foreign security policy is basically that will it be the European Union to which the member states act? If, if, if we have a strong uh, requirement for unanimity, it means that some member states in some very urgent situations will act uh, from outside the European Union. So this is basically uh, what we are talking about. Whether the European Union is an effective and functional channel for the member states. Uh, then, of course, on the other side, it is a trade-off between having the having the leverage, having the political weight of 27 member states. And for example, CSDP operations and missions are an example where we actually have the political weight of 27 or 6 within one of those, uh, of those member states. And this is what is the actually the added value of these operations compared, for example, the commission projects that basically do the same things in these third countries without the political weight of 27. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. do you want to add something? Uh, no, I absolutely agree. Uh, if I can come back a little bit to the previous question, if you don't mind, I just wanted to mention, uh, of course, one more grouping, uh, and that's the Visha Grant 4, which, uh, of course, now the situation is a little bit different, but for example, in 2014, uh, during the conflict in uh, Ukraine, uh, back then, uh, the Visegrad four countries were actually the first ones to react. It was a reaction of condemnation of actions, but it was still uh, an official reaction, which the countries were very proud, and then uh, Europe followed. Whether this has a larger impact on uh, integration, it's a question, but it kind of shows that uh, the smaller groupings can act in a quicker, more flexible way, and uh, also basically the examples that were described before, before uh, are often uh, referred to either crisis management or a situation where countries need to act really quickly. So it's naturally an, an easier and more manageable way for smaller groups as opposed to the EU as a whole, especially if, uh, if the powers of the high representatives are limited uh, when it comes to foreign security. Thank you. Unfortunately, Ms. Karia Leinen and Mr. Blockmans needs to leave us sooner because they are running to the airport to take flights to Helsinki and uh, Brussels. Is it correct? No? Both of you are going to Helsinki. Okay, thank you very much for your participation in our discussion. Can I have one minute for parting words? Of course. Looking ahead, um, the, the shape of the European Union, I think, is, uh, is to become even more differentiated. The European Council in its June conclusions, when it gave candidate country status to Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia a European perspective, essentially stated that these countries and the ones that are already in accession negotiations should benefit from gradual integration, while at the same time uh, introducing an element of reversibility when they backslide on fundamental, uh, fundamental issues. That issue of gradual integration basically offers pathways for Ukraine, for the Western Balkan countries, etc., into sectors of primarily the uh, internal market at, uh, at a later stage, but I think a key light <laughs> chapters first, uh, which will further um, change, you know, the, the modular composition in policy areas, um, counting the number of member states. So every time, basically, you look at the European Union, it's almost like a kaleidoscope. You know, okay, we go from foreign policy to energy security to, uh, uh, I don't know what, um, Green Deal, the composition might change. This poses very, uh, you know, huge challenges to the coordination and the unity of the legal order and should be really thought through and uh, that the, uh, the monitoring and the enforcement mechanisms uh, remain intact so as not to erode the fundamental uh, principle on which the single market's operation runs the single market is for me really the core where all member states remain anchored within the European Union. And that is, you know, the supranational um, governance of the system ultimately backstopped by, uh, by the court. Thank you. Yeah, maybe I can just second that comment uh, and to bring the larger perspective of the European Union now again. Uh, looking into enlargement as a foreign policy tool, as a strategic tool, uh, not only vis-à-vis -vis our neighbourhood, but also our, our uh, 
competitors uh, in a global scale. And, and this kind of gradual actions, you know, what, uh, what we want to call it, is a way at the same time to com accommodate the fragilities in the EU system and the, and the reservations of the member states towards new, uh, new members, and at the same time remain and keep that uh, endorsement process credible and, and uh, keep the countries in the neighborhood involved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our colleagues are waiting at us, so you really need to leave, not to miss your flight. So thank you very much for participating. <laughs> yes, so let's move uh, to the questions from the audience. Uh, Mr. Jakub Zientela is asking, how does the new project of the European political community fits into the multi-speed Europe, and is it an alternative to European Union's expansion? So, I don't know, Mr. Kovac, do you want to start? I can uh, also, that's a you know, tough question. Huh. I don't think it fits. I don't, I, I don't like it personally. I don't, I, don't, I don't really see a huge added value as of now for it. I mean, like, the first time it was a success, mm -hmm. uh, but it, this was a really uh, a low hanging fruit for me because you know, it was a success in terms of achieving the, the people meet there. Well, they did. That was a success for sure, uh, but substantively. Uh, then was a diplomatic success, so um, uh, that, that has to be on the line, but substantively. I don't really see a huge added value of the European political community. And to a large extent, I would say it is a result of a, you know... Or, let me rephrase, the EU should be able to do what the EBC is supposed to be doing uh, uh, itself. So, in an ideal world, or generally speaking, we would not need to have European political community uh, to do what it is supposed to do. Also, we don't know yet what it is supposed to do because you know, the agenda, the goals, the structure forms has not really been established. And it's been very difficult task for the next summit taking place in Moldova to, to, to you know, be successful because there's been a lot on the plate for a small now for reform for European government uh, in Moldova. Uh, but it's going to be very difficult to you know, achieve something without finances. Uh, but then who's going to finance it? It's, it's, is it going to be the EU budget? You know, for energy infrastructure, for instance. Well, then, you know, tell this to Germans. Uh, the French would like, well, well, tell this to French. The French want it to be completely intergovernmental, so the Commission should not be involved. The Germans would say, well, the, the Commission should be involved because it doesn't want to be the APC to be stolen by the Germans. Uh, so then perhaps the resolution will, there's going to be a kind of one off role for the Commission for the next summit in Moldova. Uh, so I, I don't really see it as a systematic way of dealing with uh, the challenges that are in front of us, uh, and I would really, you know, prefer to see uh, the EU, you know, tackling, uh, or tackling, dealing with the neighborhood or helping the neighborhood in itself without uh, necessarily establishing a new format uh, such as uh, EPC. And what I, what I see to a large extent is that even the existence of EPC results from, you know. Uh, not really so much functional relationship between France and Germany recently. Um, so perhaps it's, this is a symptom of you know this non-functional relationship between France and, and Germany. Uh, and, and obviously, eventually, a French proposal uh, to establish this mechanism. Thank you. Some countries are waiting for many years for becoming members of European Union. Do you think that? Um, the enlargement process will move in the near future. And maybe let's try to make a guessing contest. Uh, when will be the next enlargement? Uh, could you say if it's within five years, till the end of 30s or 40s or never, Mr. Havarda? And sorry, also let's move to another survey question. But maybe I will first try to address the previous question because okay. I kind of feel maybe I have more to say than, than the next one. Um, and, and you know, it's, it's, I have maybe a slightly different angle on so 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 that might be useful. Um, I think it was a huge success actually, and in demonstrating the unity of all European countries, not only the EU. And, and 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 from that perspective, if you have 44 and just to stay away, uh, out, which is very special. I mean, this is very clear signal. 
So, so, so I, I think from that perspective, it has been a success. Uh, the question is how much it can serve, as, as, as Jan was describing for the future. But I think it, it is really a potential coordinating mechanism to help us to, to, to respond to the challenge which we face, which is Russia. And, and it's not going to go away. And we need to, 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 to see this. And, and if, if, if Russia is going to, well, we don't see what's going to be the final developments or kind of like the developments which will help us uh, to, to secure our uh, Eastern uh, Eastern. So, so from that perspective, I think it is very crucial. And there are two types of, of gatherings happening. One where among the states, so so you would have a big meeting uh, from leaders coming from uh, Armenia, uh, Azerbaijan, Turkey, uh, as an example. Uh, second would be you would have a meeting between the Commission actually, so so the EU and one of the most important neighbors, which is not part of the EU, which is Turkey. So, so, so it's actually kind of you know flexible mechanism. And if we're talking about flexibility and differentiation, it seems as we don't have the the, 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 the joint one voice, and, and we don't see it as, as Steve was mentioned. I, I don't see it either in, in the coming future to actually happen. So, so from that perspective, actually, it is a flexibility mechanism, which helps us to 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 bring other countries which are not part of the EU discuss with the EU, but not necessarily as the EU, but with the United States and, and, and the Commission and, and their different formats. So, so I think from, from that perspective it can, it can be mutually beneficial and, and of course we will see how the next one in, in, in Moldova and the next one in the UK uh, goes which will probably that's on the on the internal politics in the UK. Um, on your question, I, I just I think I leave it to the best and I leave it to see that. You would say what? I would be to thank you. Okay. <laughs> and your colleagues, could you share your view? <laughs> <laughs> okay, if I may react quickly to this debate <laughs> that's ongoing about the European political community. Uh, I think it's important to know that uh, we are at a crucial time when we are in the neighborhood of a, a real conflict, a real security conflict, uh, and also we are in the middle of an energy crisis as well. So it, it was it was an important it was important for us to actually hold this platform, and it was of course a huge success for the Czech Republic uh, and and a historical moment uh, to have the first meeting of the EPC here, uh, and uh, I think that. We should look at it from another perspective as well, because having those bilateral meetings uh, that were just mentioned are also of historic importance. So it's not always just a question of what did we achieve, uh, what was the exact outcome, but there are other other discussions going on that. Um, heads of countries that haven't met in decades uh, now had a chance to meet uh, at this very important forum. Uh, but when we are discussing, and this is a bit of a criticism from my side, I'm skeptical in the long term when it comes to forums or communities like this, because I think that if we don't define measurable outcomes for this forum, and if we don't follow up on these outcomes, whether they have been implemented within a specific amount of time, then it can become meaningless quite quickly. And uh, when it comes to enlargement, I'm not an enlargement expert, but uh, I'm, I'm rather pessimistic about this. As we see on the screen, uh, most of the members of the, of the audience think that it will be before 2030. So we'll see in a few years. If, if yes. I may just quickly, I, I would go for B as well uh, before 2030, but I, I wouldn't expect this is going to be a large enlargement to perhaps one country. <laughs> Uh, we do have one front runner uh, that uh, has certain problems, uh, but I would perhaps rephrase it a little differently. Uh, will, there be, will, there, will there be enlargement without more qualified majority voting? I don't really think so, because you know, French appetite for, or at least will there be big enlargement? Will there be multiple countries joining? Well, one perhaps. But will there be more countries joining in foreseeable future without qualified majority voting in taxation, social policy, 
or, or you know, foreign policy, or at least in some of those fields, uh, I don't think this is going to happen. You know, Olaf Scholz made it clear for the German position, but I would even more more about the French position vis-à-vis -vis enlargement. No. So then I would not expect any large enlargement without at least some reform of the decision-making processes. Can I, can I just go? Of course. Thank you. I, I, because this is a little bit about what we've been doing uh, last month in the General Affairs Council. Uh, in the response to the Conference on the Future of Europe, we, we've been looking into, into this concrete proposal, which is to change uh, from the United to Cuba. And we've been looking into so called passerelles. So, so we asked the member states you know, in which areas they could imagine uh, uh, move from, 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 uh, from the United to, to Cuba. And, you know, not surprisingly, but it's, it's interesting to see it in, 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 uh, kind of, uh, in, 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 the, in the indication, because this is not normal, of course, the things can change as the government's change, everything can change. But, uh, not surprisingly, you have huge differences in where different member states want to see uh, the, the change. And, and, and basically, where we are is that you have no area where you would have kind of like not even, you know, substantive. Majority of countries, mm -hmm. so 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 I agree, and, and, and that's why at the same time I agree with you. I think large uh, enlargement, uh, if you can call it this way, uh, will require some changes in the decision making to be taken before. Uh, but I'm not so sure it's going to be like a simple move to to QMA. Maybe we will just need to be looking into in, into in, into the issue kind of like it's it's more creative, uh, it's more creative perspective. Maybe one last question from the audience. Which country do you see first joining the EU? Do you see Ukraine, Kosovo or Serbia in the Union? Who wants to answer? Maybe I can. Uh, starting from the opposite, uh, uh, the, uh, the opposite part of the table. Uh, not those uh, uh, as being the first ones. <coughs> Uh, the who, uh, either North Macedonia or Montenegro. Uh, certainly not Moldova, certainly not Ukraine, certainly not Kosovo, which is not even recognized by all member states. Not even a candidate country because it's not recognized by all member states. And I would not say, I would certainly say no, not Serbia at this point in time. But you know, times can change, politicians can change. Uh, but if I should select two, it's going to be North Macedonia and, and Montenegro. We have time for one last question. So, is there such a thing as a final, ideal stage of European Union integration? And how would you describe it? Mr. Asimov, please. Of course, I think theoretically there is an ideal, uh, ideal stage of integration where we all live happily ever after without any conflicts and we agree on every possible issues there is, but I don't think that will ever happen. Uh, it, it depends on what do you define ideal. Uh, I don't see it in the near future. For me, the major question would be whether we go into a more supranational or intergovernmental direction. Uh, where are we talking about where the majority of the powers lie in the member states, or are we giving the power to the European institutions? In my personal opinion, uh, as, uh, as I said before, as we get bigger, uh, there should be more power given to supranational institutions, but uh, I don't see that really sticking in the future. Yes? Uh, I think that uh, I'm not really, I, I, I will need probably more time to, to reflect <laughs> uh, from the presidency. <coughs> Well, I think it's maybe need to recognize that uh, this is um, a situation of vital, vital importance. So, so, so from my perspective, what's crucial is that we really maintain the unity which allows to us to, to be strong vis-à-vis -vis the threat that you face. And, 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 and the threat, the primary threat is clear, this is Russia. Uh, but, but, but there are other threats which we which we need to face, and, and I, I think um, we need to, to face them together. And, and I'm talking about uh, the, the challenge of the uh, systemic uh, challenge of China, 
and, and I'm talking as well about ability to actually secure uh, supply chains, basically, and, 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 and to have external uh, <coughs> coordination is uh, uh, the need to, 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 to make sure there are resources on the on, on, on the on the internal market. And, 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 and I think, uh, you know, if you ask me, I do, uh, I don't exactly have the structure, but at the end, how it function is that, that we strong and it is going to set the rules uh, politically, military, and of course economical. What was your question? What's your ideal final stage? stage of European integration. I will uh, take it, you know, because the end it's the end of, 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 of the debate. So we'll take it from a little wider perspective. Uh, European integration is a process. Uh, you know what happens at the computers when you add processes? You, you, may, you may see blue screen of that. Uh, the end of the process of European integration is disintegration. But it's not ideal end stage. I don't think there is an ideal end of the process of European integration just because of this process. Right? Processes do not usually have an end. Uh, because you know times change, politics change, you always have to adapt. So the ideal end stage is that the process is adapting to the challenges uh, that it is facing at any point in time and does it effectively uh, so as to benefit the people. Uh, will live in the European uh, Union at any given you know point in point in time. So the end, as I said, otherwise the end stage is the you know uh, the disintegration and the screen of that of the EU. But that's sort of not an ideal uh, end stage. So you know, I, would, I mean, perhaps because there is no end, there's never there's never going to be an end that you will achieve, and then this is it, and we can all rest, and that's the end of the fairy tale. You know, your politics and lives, you know, societies to move forward this way. Thank you. Unfortunately, our time is up. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming to our panel discussion. Dear guests, uh, thank you very much for interesting and inspirational discussion. Thank you.